This is Dr. Tawari. And this is Dr. Kochak. And you're listening to the Breast Podcast Podcast Ever. Ever. Broadcasting from Columbus, Ohio, we'll be talking about plastic surgery procedures focusing on only the breast. Ranging from breast reconstruction to breast enhancement and reduction, we'll cover everything you ever wanted to know about the breast. Hey, good morning, everybody. We are so happy that you joined us for the breast podcast ever. We've got Dr. Kochak and myself here. We're super excited today to bring whole living Lauren, Lauren to our podcast. She's an expert in all things diet, nutrition. We've talked to her before on some of the Facebook live uh, events that we've done. But uh, Lauren, thank you for joining us here today. Why don't you go ahead and take it away and introduce yourself to our to our people here. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to speak to you guys. It's always so fun to chat about these topics. But I'm Lauren Blake. I'm a registered dietitian. I am the founder and creator of my brand, Whole Living Lauren, which is a nutrition brand geared to help people feel, look their best, answer and kind of declutter all the nutrition questions that people have. And yeah, I just feel really passionate about nutrition and wellness and nourishing ourselves with whole real food. So that's kind of the, the basis of my, my brand and my company. I've been a dietitian for, I don't even remember how many years at this point, but I've worked in a lot of different settings. So I do have a clinical background. I've worked in wellness. I've worked in sports nutrition. So it's been fun for me to just kind of dip my, my toes in a lot of different areas in nutrition. So Lauren, are you, are you entirely dedicated now with all your time to, to doing the whole living Lauren and your, and your uh, brand? I am. Yes. I did whole living Lauren stuff, mostly working with brands and doing things on social media for several years while I was still working in a traditional job as a wellness dietitian. And about two years ago, I left my, my corporate job and went full-time. What made you do that? That's uh, we're always you know, interested to hear why people leave their corporate positions and kind of strike out on their own. What made you do it? At the time when I quit my job, I had, my son was only a couple months old, I think three months old. And I was really craving the flexibility. The opportunity to kind of do that on my own terms was very appealing to me. I also like to do a lot of different things with my job. I like to work one-on-one with doctors and offices and I liked that creative freedom. So it was a great, great jumping off point for me to just, I mean, you don't ever feel like you're ready. I was terrified, (laughs) but I think for me, I just had to take the leap and trust the process and it's worked out so far. Yeah, we love that. We love uh, entrepreneurship stories, but let's, Mm -hmm. you know, some common questions for us are, what should I be eating before surgery? What should I be eating after surgery? how should I think of detoxification in my life? So we'd love to be able to refer people to experts. So you're kind of our expert. So how would you answer some of those patient questions? Yeah, I mean, you know, nutrition is very individual to me. When I work with a, a client, I like to look at the whole picture. But there are definitely things that everyone benefits from, you know, when I'm speaking to a larger population. So there are certainly different nutrients that you want to really think about before surgery and after surgery to help optimize your healing. When I'm talking about that, I'm referring to vitamins A, C, E, K, B vitamins, and zinc. Those are all nutrients that really help your body maintain cell growth, repair tissue, and also to help reduce excess bleeding and bruising after surgery. There's also another really interesting enzyme that I think is cool because I like to eat it. I like to eat the fruit that it's derived from, which is bromelain. It's an enzyme derived from pineapples. And there has been great research about its anti-inflammatory properties, as well as playing a significant role in reducing bruising and swelling. Are you so, going to have to spell that one for us, Lauren? So, so what's the, <laughs> what, 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 is, what is this one? It's B-R-O-E-M-E-L-A-I-N, bromelain. bromelain. Uh, what's it found in besides pineapples for people that maybe not like pineapples? It's really predominantly found in pineapples. I'm honestly, all the research has to do with pineapples and I'm not really sure where else it's found in. That's a great question. You can take a supplement if you don't like pineapple. 
So it's something that you can easily, you know, incorporate into a supplement regimen if that's something that you're looking for. What what are your feelings on supplements in general? Do you take your own supplements? Do you recommend them to your patients? You know, how do you how do you approach that question? What what supplement should I be on? Yeah, I, I typically don't like to recommend supplements without looking at someone's whole picture. However, I you know, if someone's going into surgery, I definitely think a multivitamin is, is a must. I think, you know, research shows that you can take extra vitamin A and vitamin C, especially those are really, really great for surgical healing and also to help your immune system, which is very important pre and post surgery. I like to recommend for people who are not about to go into surgery, I, I like to focus on food and diet first, because sometimes I think supplements, when people are taking vitamins and supplements, they're kind of lax about not getting, not eating fruits and vegetables because they think, oh, I'm, I'm getting the nutrients. But food is so synergistic. And a lot of times there are nutrients in foods that help other nutrients that are also found in that food become absorbed or become bioavailable in your body. So food first, but certainly there's a place for supplementation. And I think pre and post surgery is one of them. So, you know, a question that I always get is when should I start my supplements before surgery? That's a great question. General rule of thumb, I say is about two weeks. So I I recommend taking a multivitamin two weeks before, you know, starting it then if you're not already. And again, like I mentioned, you can start to think about taking a vitamin A or vitamin C, especially with vitamin C, it's a water soluble vitamin. So you don't need to take tons and tons of vitamin C, but you can take, you know, a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. And if your body doesn't need it, it's just going to excrete it out. But it's good to have those stores, you know, those nutrient stores built up. I also recommend to a week before surgery, that's when you really want to get serious about your diet. So avoiding simple carbohydrates, choosing more whole grains. The point of that is we really want to keep your blood sugar. What, uh, what is a whole grain? I don't even know what a whole grain is. A whole grain is a grain that has all of its parts intact. So there's different parts of a grain and a whole grain just means it hasn't been processed to take some of those outer coverings out. Like a a processed grain is, I mean, an easy example is white bread. They've taken some of the outer shell essentially of a whole grain out so that it's softer. But with that, they're also taking out a lot of fiber and nutrients. So when we're talking about blood sugar, blood sugar is very, very important for overall health, but especially for wound and scar healing too. So that's why I talk about doing whole grains, um, more fiber filled foods. I talk about blood sugar a lot with my clients. And when we think about blood sugar, I want you to think about peaks and valleys versus rolling hills. So what we want to avoid is these high peaks and low valleys with blood sugar, then your body is just in this constant up and down. It's trying to, it's just not good news. It affects a lot of different systems in your body. But what we want to do is your blood sugar should be more like rolling hill. So it should come up slowly and come down slowly. Fiber helps with that. So that's found in whole grains. Protein and healthy fat help with that as well. So get serious about controlling your blood sugar through through fiber-filled foods. Um, Eat at least... Maybe avoid avoid pastas, avoid a lot of kind of white bread, wonder bread, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you don't need to to avoid pastas per se. I mean, not all pastas are created equal. If you're looking for a more fiber-filled pasta, they have tons of bean and legume-based pastas on the market now that have a lot more fiber and a lot more protein. That's a great option. It feels comforting too. So, you know, you don't have to eat like a totally raw vegan diet to be healthy, even though, I mean, legume-based pastas are very plant-based and still very good for you. What about these Dexcom monitors? Have you ever seen those things? I had a friend of mine that had this on. It's like a continuous blood glucose monitor. They use it on diabetics a lot. Yeah. Um, I always kind of wondered if nutritionists use them to kind of monitor those peaks and valleys like you were talking about. Some probably do. Um, I don't, but I think people who struggle to control their blood sugar or who are really serious about learning their blood sugar habits, I think that's a great tool. The more you know, the better, of course, but you, don't, you certainly don't need one of those if you don't have a history of uncontrolled blood sugars. What about bleeding and bruising? Those are things that come up a lot too. Is there anything 
in the diet that can impact your, your bruising or how much you bleed? Yeah, that bromelain from the pineapples. There's tons of research about that, which I, again, is so fascinating. That's really good. All the vitamins that I talked about, the, especially the A, the C, the zinc, those are all good to vitamin K, you know, all of those are really good to help control excess bleeding and bruising. That's all according to research. So those would be my, my top suggestions for sure. So generally speaking, you know, healthy diet, healthy balanced diet for really a minimum of two weeks before surgery. We usually tell people, you know, we talk to people a lot about smoking. Mm-hmm. And so smoking is a minimum of three weeks, but really more like six weeks before any type of surgery. You know, I think for diet, it's probably about the same. Wouldn't you agree? You know, two weeks is a minimum, but the longer you can do that before an elective surgery, the better. Absolutely. I mean, these are things that, you know, eating more fiber filled foods, eating more fruits and vegetables, eating a small amount of protein at each meal. These are things I recommend to everyone. So you don't have to wait until, you know, a week or two before your surgery to start these. I totally agree with your point. We should really be doing these things all the time, but, you know, definitely ramp them up as soon as possible. You're just going to do your body better and you're going to promote a lot of anti-inflammation. And, you know, when you have a procedure done, your body is going to create inflammation and that it's a good thing in in some ways, but, you know, we want to reduce a lot of this chronic inflammation that I'm sure a lot of your patients feel like they, they're probably suffering from as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a really big and important topic for us because so many of our breast implant illness patients, a big component of what is going on with them is this, this inflammation concern. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them will try going gluten-free. They'll make significant changes in their diet in order to reduce their inflammation. And in speaking to them, it seems to help their symptoms. Mm-hmm. And I guess the larger point there is anything that you can take away that is, you know, sort of inflammatory in your body seems to improve their symptoms, but it's also hard to recommend a diet that's, you know, I don't know if anti-inflammatory is the right word or, or not, but what things in your diet can you think about adding or removing to deal with this inflammation issue? Good question. It's a question I get a lot from my clients as well. So this sounds so simple and I've feel like I probably sound like a broken record, but according to research, I mean, a diet high in fruits and vegetables, which naturally means a diet high in fiber, is probably one of the best defenses against against chronic inflammation. There have been studies that show that people who increase their intake of fruits and vegetables to have at least four fruits and at least four vegetables per day have significantly lower inflammatory markers in in their blood work. And they also have decreased biomarkers of oxidative stress. So that, that overall stress in your body that causes inflammation. So I think that's really a great takeaway is that we don't have to necessarily go on these crazy restrictive diets. Now, in some cases that is beneficial for people. As far as things to think about reducing in your diet, when we talk about inflammation, we want to look at trans fatty acids, saturated fat, and excess omega-6 fatty acids. Those have been proven to promote inflammation. And omega-6 fatty acids and trans fatty acids are found in a lot of highly processed foods. So it's hard to say exactly what the, what, where those are found because they can be found really in a lot of places. But when you think about trans fatty acids and omega-6, we just, I think about a lot of processed foods and then like saturated I, fats. Like Kraft and cheese. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's probably some of those things in Kraft no, Mac and Cheese. No disrespect to Kraft Mac and Cheese because it's delicious, but it's, it's probably delicious. not that thing for you. Exactly. And then what I like to focus a lot on is the things that you should add to your diet because it's more fun to add things than just take everything away. So I like to really focus on omega-3 fatty acids, which is found in fatty fish like salmon, and then chia seeds, walnuts, canola oil, flaxseed oil ascorbic acid, which is essentially vitamin C food. So think citrus. And talking about vitamin C, I was just talking about this on another um, work thing I just did. But one red bell pepper actually has almost double the vitamin C as an orange. So a little fun fact for you. And then vitamin E, which is found in seeds and nuts, and then prebiotics and probiotics, which is, you know, those are to help promote gut health. But those are the things that that you... Basically a probiotic? 
Yeah. Um, probiotics are naturally found in fermented foods like yogurt or kombucha. Kefir, kombucha. Yep. Tempeh, which is a plant-based protein source. You can also take a probiotic supplement. That's what, what I do. And then prebiotics, you can take a supplement for it, but I actually prefer to just get it through food. So prebiotic, it's a certain type of fiber that's found in a lot of plant foods. So it's essentially food for a probiotic. So you're getting the whole shebang there. Hmm. You mentioned a lot about natural sources for fiber and how important it is preoperatively to regulating sugar uh, levels. So there's a lot of fiber supplements out there and Mm -hmm. fiber is a confusing topic. And then after surgery, it's not the sugar piece, it's the pooping piece. So maybe you can help us kind of understand sort of how that all works, because what supplements are we taking before surgery? Are they different than the ones we take after? I, I think I know the answer, but I'd really like to hear it from you. So. Yeah, I don't recommend a change in supplements before and after. I don't know what you guys typically recommend. One thing I I would really want to hit hard on is fluid and water intake too, especially after surgery. When we're talking about going to the bathroom, helping your body, you know, excrete the way it needs to, we need fiber because that helps push things through the di- the digestive system, but if we don't have enough water, it's just going to sit there and that's not fun for anyone. <laughs> so you really want to make sure that you are staying well hydrated to push everything through. But fiber, of course, I mean, fiber is really important for helping prevent constipation after surgery for sure. But as long as it's paired with fluids. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting because back, back when Dr. Kochak and when I were in training, you know, the restrictions of eating before surgery, all those things, I think, if anything, serve to maybe undernourish a patient before the operation. And now, certainly at some of the places we operate, we'll let people even drink liquids until several hours prior to the operation to make sure that they're hydrated, to make Mm -hmm. sure that their recovery post-op is a little bit easier. So it's really been a change in how we think about diet and nutrition, even in the immediate preoperative phase. You know, there's one more thing that I really want to I want to talk about, we were talking about bleeding a little bit Mm -hmm. and another supplement that comes up a lot, which I don't know a lot about is this, is Arnica Montana, Arnica. Is this one that you're familiar with at all? I'm not as familiar with that one to be totally honest. Yeah. It's one that we see among patients. I think there's some suggestions out there that it may reduce your chance for bruising and bleeding. I don't know. You know, uh, we've looked at some of the literature on it, and I don't have a clear sense of how much of a difference it makes, but it seems to be popular among patients. So I want to get your thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes I'm a little bit leery of, of supplements because it can affect people different, different ways. And certain supplements can affect your liver in, in ways that we don't always want. But If a supplement has been shown to work, I mean, I'm all for it. I, like I said, I'm not as familiar with that one, but if research supports that, I think it's, it could be a great, you know, addition to just your toolbox before surgery. So another huge issue for us, and this is, I think maybe more in our reconstructive breast patients is one of weight loss. Yeah. And weight loss is a really difficult one Mm because it's hard to lose weight for anybody. But particularly for some of the the DIEP flat breast reconstructions we do, where we're using patients' own tissues for a natural reconstruction, patients with a body mass index above 38, Mm -hmm. certainly above 40, they have a higher complication rate. And part of what we try to do in our consultations is to lay out some thoughts about how, how can you lose weight in a safe, effective fashion. So what what is a safe rate of weight loss? A pound a week, a pound a month? You know, what is a good thing for patients to think about? Yeah, we always recommend about a pound or two of weight loss a week is a very healthy, and that's a, actually a pretty quick way to lose weight. You know, a lot of times people want this instant gratification of, you know, they're starting to eat healthier and they get frustrated that they're only losing a pound or two. But that's exactly where we want you to to be because we want your body's metabolism to be able to catch up with everything. You know, if you lose, this really isn't even realistic, but just as an example, if you were to lose, you know, 20 pounds in a week of true body fat, 
then your metabolism is, your body is really not catching up to that. We want it to be slow and steady. We've also, research shows that if you lose weight at a more consistent weight, you're more likely to keep it off. And that is very important. I mean, in every environment I've worked at in as a dietitian, I've seen tons of people who have lost these rapid, have lost weight so rapidly, which is exciting and, and, and awesome. And then they just gain it back because the way they lost that weight is not sustainable to them. And I is talk that with, mostly, is that mm-hmm. water weight when you lose weight that quickly? Or is that actually like a caloric deficit that you've put yourself in to then it's, yeah, it, that muscle? It, that you, hit, you, it, you hit it right there. Typically, when patients or clients lose weight at a very rapid w- rate, it's a complete caloric deficit and it's too much of a caloric deficit. So you're not just losing fat, you're losing muscle. And then what happens when you lose rapid muscle, your, your metabolism slows down. So we don't want to lose a lot of that muscle mass. We want to lose the fat mass and then hopefully build muscle, but at least maintain. If you lose a lot of weight, you probably will lose a little bit of muscle and that's okay as long as just it's a little bit. But if we're losing tons of weight in a very short amount of time, you'll, you're probably losing muscle mass too. So if we tell somebody that you know, we're looking at a 20 pound weight loss, that really is a three to six month time frame. Yeah. And to do it safely and effectively, absolutely. And I, I talk to people a lot about looking at the quality of the f- not not the quality meaning like expensive food, but looking at nutrient density as opposed to just caloric density. Because when we're just focusing on calories, we might not feel as satisfied. For example, let's let's say we're eating a a nutrition bar that's 250 calories, you know, it's, it's tiny, it's small. So we eat that and our stomachs are not really satisfied because our stomachs don't sense fullness off of calories. It's our brain to say, I'm full. But if we eat a lot of plant foods or high fiber foods, not necessarily in a tiny little bar, we're eating more volume. So we're eating more volume of food, but with less calories really, because those foods are typically less calories than a lot of prepackaged foods. Hmm. So greater volumes of food, healthier plant-based foods, rather than kind of real dense processed foods. Exactly. Exactly. And of course, I know I've talked a lot about plant foods. I don't want to discredit, you know, protein sources or healthy fat sources, because those are, that's really the complete package of making sure that you are eating in a very nutritionally sound way. And protein is very important for wound healing too. I feel like I've just focused a lot on plants, which plants do have protein as well. But protein, you know, especially for wound healing and, and after surgery, you know, it's not a myth. You do need a lot of, you do need extra protein. You just don't need tons and tons of protein and you need to really pair that with those rich plant foods. So what about, what about how, you know, this is all great. I love it. I wish it was, but, but in reality... I'm going to be eating whatever I can put in my passenger seat when I'm driving in and out of work. And I'm going to usually get it through a drive through So how do you counsel people with uh, the whole lifestyle of, you know, eating out? That's, it's really tough. I talk about this all the time with my clients and I wish there was some, some way that I could say, yeah, it's, it's fine to just eat out all the time. I wish there was a way to make that okay and, and work, but it's hard to meet your weight loss goals or your health goals if you're eating out all the time. If you can think a little bit about what the meals you're going to eat ahead of time might be, and even pack snacks. I'm not even talking, I'm not a meal prepper. I don't like meal prepping. It stresses me out. <laughs> so I don't expect everyone to you know, prep all their meals all the time and never eat out. But if you're going to, you know, a general rule of thumb is try to include a vegetable at every meal if you can. I know it's tough when we're at fast food restaurants, but even like a Subway, I mean, you can load, load those subs with veggies. And then if you're packing snacks yourself, hopefully you won't go overboard when you are eating out. If you're going to a sit down restaurant, my rule of thumb is fill half of your plate with vegetables. You want to aim for a lean protein. You can do a starchy side and then half of your plate really should be those Green vegetables is, is great, um, but any vegetables, half of your plate, that's a good rule of thumb. And I think another question might come up is, you know, how does alcohol factor into all this, especially with people going, you know, with a surgery a few weeks down the road? Yeah, I mean, alcohol doesn't really help any situations. It's, it's probably best to, as much as, 
you know, we would all love to have some drinks to just relax us. Alcohol is not really inducive to wound healing. There have been studies that it does promote some inflammation in the body. So as much as if you can reduce that even a little bit, you're going to just help yourself out. Yeah. You know, another thing that I always kind of talk to patients about when it comes to weight loss is you know, a lot of people will say, you know, I'm going to hit the gym two, three, four, five times a week. And the point that I always make to them is, you know, weight loss is really a lot more about nutrition, 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 mm -hmm. and then exercise. Do you think mm -hmm. that's a fair way to think about it? Or the, the abs, they're made in the kitchen, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, you can't out exercise a bad diet. It starts in the kitchen with nutrition and the exercise is beneficial for so many other things. But if we're talking about weight loss and, and getting to a healthy weight, it's really mostly about the food. The exercise is an added bonus, but we cannot just rely on exercise for weight loss. I think an, an area of confusion for patients is, okay, I've gone through my surgery and I'm recovering now. So it's okay for me to go back to my old habits. How do you talk to patients about using this as an opportunity to maybe change some bad habits? And you put in all this hard work to recover from surgery. How can we get people to continue these good habits? Well, if you're doing these for, you know, three to four weeks, if you're doing these good habits for three to four weeks, which you should, even though you're recovering, you might start to feel a little bit better. You might be forming those habits already. And so, you know, think about what makes you feel really good. And then if you, as, if you can stick to that, I mean, that's, that's great. I think it's really helpful to have an accountability person or something to just help you r remember to stay accountable to, to your goals and, and why. You know, I talk a lot about mindfulness with my clients and I always ask people to ask themselves a couple questions, you know, before they're eating. Am I hungry? Is what I'm eating going to make me feel good? Is it going to give me energy? Is it, you know, why am I eating this? So if we can think about even just for five seconds, why we're doing something before we do I, it. I mostly just eat when I'm bored. Yeah. Well, we've all been experiencing that right now. <laughs> like I get, and, if I'm bored, my go-to is the fridge. Yeah. Well, you know, I've noticed that about myself too, because I'm not used to being home as, as much. And especially the first two weeks of this quarantine, I was in the fridge all the time. And I, I mean, I'm a dietitian. This is what I talk to people about all the time. And for me, the mindfulness really helps. Again, am I hungry? Like, am I even hungry? What am I doing this for? There's different types of hunger. You know, there's a boredom hunger, a sight hunger, a smell hunger. But if we feel a true physiological hungry, hunger, then we should be in the fridge. But if not, think about why you're doing something. And if we think about that, we'll hopefully, maybe some of the times, choose the better option for us. If I'm lurking in front of the fridge, my daughter will always ask me, she's like, are you even hungry? <laughs> there you go. There's your <laughs> accountability person. <laughs> what about apps like MyFitnessPal? Are those useful for people? I think uh, some, pe yeah, I think some people, um, I know some people really thrive with those. If you are someone who does really well with tracking, I think MyFitnessPal is a great tool. Personally, I'm not. I don't know. Some people get too obsessive about it. And that can be kind of a counterintuitive thing to our goals. But yeah, I think for some people, it can be a really great tool, especially when you're in the learning phase, uh, when you're in the discovery phase of, of noticing your habits. Now, we, we don't have to go into like every diet out there, but just, you know, one of the, one of the ones that's super like hot lately, especially the last couple of years, is this whole concept that my brother is a, is a, I mean, he is an adamant intermittent faster. I mean, he's been doing it now with great results, man, it's been probably over a year, maybe longer. And he does mm -hmm. it. He, he sticks to it rigidly and yeah. he does it every day. And he's a 16 to 20 hour guy, you know? And so I'd love to get your thoughts on only because everywhere you go it, within about five minutes of talking about weight loss, some there's someone at the table who's intermittent fasting, especially in the morning person who's only having black coffee at breakfast, they're intermittent fasting. So. Absolutely. It's such a hot topic. And I think you, you said the key there, your brother is, a, he's, he does it the right way. He, he doesn't budge with it. And that's what you have to do to be able to be successful with intermittent fasting. You can't, you got to be all in for it to work. But there is research that says that intermittent fasting can really reduce chronic inflammation can, I mean, it helps people lose weight. 
I know just from clients, I've had clients do it. I'm very open to like, let's try this. You know, if you think you can do it, let's try it. Some people can do it and they have the discipline to do it. And then other people, it's very difficult. So I think it can certainly work. There's research to support it. I know I couldn't do it, <laughs> but I think it's great when people can. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. I, I, I really, yeah. I read about it and I wanted to really understand, is it, is it really changing your metabolism and how you handle your, you know, your insulin spikes and whatever? And, or, or is it just restricting the window in which you can stuff calories in? Because I'm really good at putting calories in. If you give me four hours, I could probably get two days <laughs> worth of calories in. So right, I'd be right. really curious. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's conflicting research as with anything, really. It depends on what your goal, you know, you can probably find research to support whatever viewpoint you're, you're trying to find. But yeah, it, it's hard to say. I mean, there, again, there's research to support the metabolic changes, but then to your point, I mean, it's, it's hard to know for sure. It's funny. I'm just kind of like thinking about this conversation as we're talking and you know, food is so complicated. You know, it should be, food should be like joyful and social and interactive, but can also, it can also be guilt laden and, you know, anxiety provoking. And I'm sure you see that a lot, you know, in talking to your clients. How do you help them navigate all these social issues around food that have nothing to do with how many calories you put in your mouth? But there's sort of everybody has a culture around food. I mean, those cultures are different for different people. Like, how, yeah. how does that factor into the people that you talk to? It's, you know, food, what I've learned from just, you know, being a dietitian, working with people is that food is so much more than just calories. It's to your point, it's so much more than, you know, eat this, not that. Food is attached, we attach food with memories. It's social, it's emotional, it's, and it should be all those things. First and foremost, I want food to be fun and I want people to enjoy eating. I see a lot with clients because I think our society, especially, you know, there's, we, I don't know, we've, we've become obsessed with nutrition. I mean, some people, we got to find the latest this, that we need to hyper-focus on certain nutrients and, and that can feel really overwhelming. I mean, people are confused and that honestly sucks. You know, I wish that it wasn't so complicated, but what I just try to remind people is that food is not bad. You know, there is no bad food. There are foods that nourish us more than others. And if we're aiming to nourish ourselves with, with real whole foods the majority of the time and realizing that that feels really good, then that's the goal. We don't want to, I never want to demonize food and say like, oh gosh, this food is, it's a, it's a never, you can never eat this. This is horrible for you. That's where that guilt really comes in, and that's not what it should be about. It's if it, it is a work in process, you know. It's we're just inundated with all of this information, and sometimes it can feel very overwhelming. So I, when in doubt, I mean, I really try to remind people to simplify, simplify foods, simplify what you're eating, and that can kind of bring you back to just feeling better about food. And I think it's hard because not only is it a confusing topic from like a science and nutrition aspect, but good food is expensive, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's difficult. No, not everyone's going to shop at Whole Foods or, or wherever. And so it's hard to find the right type of food that's affordable. Right. And so I don't, you know, it's hard to, to tell patients to go and, you know, not everybody can obviously meal prep, not everybody, mm -hmm. you know, has somebody that can be accountable for their diet. So how do you kind of how do you address that piece for patients? You know, it, unfortunately in our society, it's expensive to eat well. Yeah. And it's cheap to eat poorly. Mm -hmm. I know it feels so backwards, but it's, it's definitely, you know, I am very aware of that and try to be very sensitive to that because it's, it's such a shame that eating healthy can, can sometimes be more expensive. And what I say to that is just take little steps, you know, Every grocery store that has produce, I mean, most grocery stores have produce. Shop the sales. There's always sales on produce, especially when things are in season. Look at frozen fruits and vegetables too. They have just as much, if not more nutrients than fresh foods, depending on where the fresh foods have, have traveled and can a lot of times be, by, be quite a bit cheaper. So that's a great option just for 
sneaking in any fruits or vegetables any way you can and also keeping them for a long period of time. I know a lot of times when people are trying to improve their diet or eat more whole foods, there can be a lot of food waste because you're just not eating the produce quick enough. So I like frozen foods as an option. And also, I mean, I know I just gave some specific recommendations about before surgery, but in general, maybe don't try to do it all at one time if you're someone who might feel overwhelmed with that because it can feel really overwhelming. So just focus on one meal at a time, you know, any way that you can get a vegetable in if it's frozen, fresh, even if it's, if it's canned, that's okay too. Any way that you can get it in is, is a win. And if nothing else, focus on water. Water is so, so beneficial for everyone. And every single system and cell in our body uses water. And water helps our body's natural detoxification organs, which are your liver and your kidneys, flush things out and function properly. So if you can't eat you know, a lot of produce, think about water first. Yeah, I, uh, I hate drinking water. I don't like the way it tastes. So I'll always put like... It doesn't taste like anything. (laughs) I know. I just, it's, I find it very boring. So I'll put like a little bit of lemon or something in my water and uh, it just makes it, you know, more, I'm more apt to take in my six or seven glasses. What's supposed to be six glasses, seven glasses a day? It depends on your body weight, but I mean, at least, at least seven to eight, I like to recommend, I mean... I recommend a lot of water for my for most of my clients if they don't have any other contradicting health issues. But we are drinking a lot of water over here. But doing lemon, cucumber, berries, whatever you have to do to drink more water, do it. But, I have a I have a tip. You can use okay. uh, herbal tea bags. There you, you drop go. an herbal tea bag in um in a like a bottle, and it's uh, there's no caffeine, there's no sugar, and it tastes really good. That's like- awesome. See, even I learned something new about nutrition today. <laughs> it's actually really good. The bodybuilders, because they have to have so much water. I learned it from a bodybuilder friend of mine. They yeah. said after, I mean, they're sometimes putting several gallons of fluid down a day and they just, they, yeah. They, yeah, so. That's well, a great a, tip. I got a coronavirus related question for you. Oh boy. So, uh-huh. uh, a friend of mine has just said that she is never going to go grocery shopping again. Okay. Because of all these delivery options that have now started. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you think about that? That people are going to be sort of ordering their produce off of an app or whatever now, rather than going to the grocery store and taking a look at the pineapple or taking a look at the, you know, the fresh vegetables. Do you see that happening? And how do you see that sort of affecting us in this post pandemic world? Yeah. I mean, I think definitely people are probably going to be ordering groceries more because of everything you just mentioned. And I think as However, you need to get your fruits and vegetables in and feel safe about it and do it in a safe way, do it. I mean, hopefully someday we'll get to a point where going to the grocery store feels safer than it does right now. But I mean, in the meantime, I think we just have to do what we have to do to, to get those fruits and vegetables, even though someone's picking them out. I mean, what can you do at this point? But hopefully we'll be able to get back in there and, and get reconnected with our food a little bit more. <laughs> And then I don't know. I mean, who knows what the summer is going to look like, but if farmers markets, again, I don't know what things are going to look like, but sometimes you can actually get cheaper produce if it's directly from the source. And then it's also a good way to get connected with your food too. Well, I feel like I'm like a million times smarter about nutrition after our little (laughs) thing today. This has been actually fantastic, Lauren. We don't want to keep you on here forever, but we would love to get you back on this breast podcast ever, uh, yes. because I'm sure that just people watching this now will probably generate some questions and some conversation. We can come back maybe with uh, some more topics, but this has been enlightening. Perfect. Well, yeah, good. Look, give, uh, give people your information. Where can they find you? Yeah, thank you. Um, you can find me at wholelivinglauren.com. My social media handle is at wholelivinglauren. You can find me pretty much anywhere. So feel free to check me out shoot me an email, check out the site. I have lots of plant-based recipes on there too. So that could be a good tool for you, but I would love to connect. So keep me in the loop. Ask me any questions. We're in quarantine. So I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Lauren. Thank you. Thank, thank right, you drink, so much. Drink your water, people. Drink your water. Thanks for listening. We hope you found this episode helpful. Want more info? Connect with us at mwbreast.com. And go behind the scenes with us on Instagram at mwbreast. Thanks for tuning in. And join us next week.